Good evening to everyone present here. I request all the panelists to kindly unmute themselves and switch on their videos. Thank you. A very good evening to everyone who have joined us here today to be a part of this academic initiative. I, Sankeetana A, will be your moderator for today. I take immense pleasure in welcoming all the esteemed members of the Karnataka State Bar Council Law Ac Academy, distinguished advocates and lawyers, academic scholars, students, and everyone else who have joined us this evening to be a part of this imperative lecture series. Uh, the three new criminal laws which came into effect exactly a week ago are slowly but surely changing the dynamics of our justice system. This week-long lecture series will indeed help us get a deeper understanding of the same. We request you to remain silent throughout the duration of the event and not to switch on your audio or video throughout the duration of the lecture. Now, I would like to call upon Mr. Hari, sir, member of Karnataka State Bar Council to deliver his welcome address. Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanura Mardanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagatur. Jagatige Guruagirta Kantaha Sri Krishna again and a Namaskar Aglanatilista. Krishna Bhagavad Gita Lelirvante Karmane Vadikaraste Mafale Shukada Chana Ma Karma Fala Yetur Burma Te Sanguatsa Karmani. Andre Ninege Karma Madhurali Matra Adikara Ide Adre Fala. Palagrana, Prati Palagrana, Apexa Madabardo. Aderi Tiagi Nam Wakil Rusaha Tam Karma on the Martar. Are out there on the case and Bandre, fees and expect Marde, Modlu case and Telt Kondo or Kashtavan and Kelly, Adana Bagayer said the Melgade, or a stay Falavana Kodli, I know Apexa Marde, Karma on the Martai. Intaha Wakil Raniswarta Seve was Kurwagi. Nam Karnataka Bar Councillo, Karnataka Raja Wakil Reporshat, Yawatu Jote Jatiagi Kelsamata Yeldrugu Gotir Takanta Vishya, Kendra Sarkara Nama Yeno Muru Criminal Law Senida, Indian Evidence Act, Criminal Procedure Court, Indian Penal Court, E. Actical Gay, Wasa Rupo on Koto, Baratia Saksha Diniama, Baratia Nagarika Suraksha Samhite. Baratia Naya Samite and Deli Tidu particular Nathur Tandu, E. Tingala, Vandane Tarik Ninda, Avu Jari Kurse. E. Nitnali Navuro, E. Kanu and Abbasa on the Madbeko, Kanu Nagalana, Tilt Kodbeko, Idrindagi, E. Muru Vasati to particular Kanu Nina, Upanyasa Malkena, Karnataka Raja Vakil Reporshatina, La Academy Vatinda, Praramamat. E. Karakram Dali. Karnataka Raja Wakil Rupar Shatina, La Academia, Adyak Shradanta, Shiuta, Gautam Chandavru Pastitaridare, Aurige, Wakil Rupar Shatina Parwagi, El Nanavik Tikawagi, Nimel Rupawagi, Nan Swagatona Baisken. Aderi Tiagi, Karnataka Raja Wakil Rupar Shatina, La Academia, Maji Adyakshru, Iria Nayavadi Gravit Takanta, Shiuta, Basuraj or Yes Basuraj or ಈ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮದಲ್ಲಿ ಉಪಸ್ಥಿತಿ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವರಿಗೂ ಸಹ ನಾನು ಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನು ಬಯಸ್ತೇನೆ ಅದೇ ರೀತಿಯಾಗಿ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ರಾಜ್ಯ ವಕೀಲರ ಪರಿಷತ್ತಿನ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಮೇಲೆ ಕಾಣಿಸ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಇನ್ನು ಅನೇಕ ಸದಸ್ಯರುಗಳು ಉಪಸ್ಥಿತಿ ಇರಬಹುದು ಎಲ್ಲ ನಮ್ಮ ಗೌರವಾನಿತ ಸದಸ್ಯರುಗಳಿಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಅಧ್ಯಕ್ಷರು ಉಪಾಧ್ಯಕ್ಷರು ಸಹ ಇರತಕ್ಕಂತ ಇರಬಹುದು ನನಗೆ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಮೇಲೆ ಕಾಣಿಸ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ರಾಜ್ಯ ವಕೀಲರ ಪರಿಷತ್ತಿನ ಅಧ್ಯಕ್ಷರು ಉಪಾಧ್ಯಕ್ಷರು ಮತ್ತೆ ಎಲ್ಲ ಸದಸ್ಯರುಗಳಿಗೆ Nano, Elder Parwagi, Wakil Parshat in Parwagi, Nan Swagatana Baistene. Upanasaka Maliki Ali, Baratia Saksha Adiniama, Modne Dagi, Yosa in Evidence Act and Bandide, Yuat Ninda, Anerne Tarik Norge, the Sumar Aidu Dinagalakala, on the Upanasa Maliki Rete, Upanasa Maliki, Dinatitia, Sainkal Ar in the Yelegant Room, at Yelegant and the Yelegant Adnai the Nimstorge, question and answer irate. Malikeli, Upanyasa Nidlike, Karnataka, Raj Uchanea Leda, Iria Nayavadiglu, Agana Saha Particular Agirta Kanta, Sham Shamsundar over there, the Shaman Antana Berta, 
ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವರು ಬಹಳ ಉತ್ಸುಕದಿಂದ ಇಡೀ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕದ ಜನತೆಗೆ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕದ ವಕೀಲರುಗಳಿಗೆ ಮತ್ತು ಇದರಿಂದ ಪ್ರಯೋಜನ ಪಡ್ಕೊಂಡ ಇರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಎಲ್ಲ ಸಾರ್ವಜನಿಕರಿಗೆ ನಾನು ನನ್ನ ಕೈಯಲ್ಲಾದಷ್ಟು ನಾನು ಹೇಳ್ತೇನೆ ಅಂತೇಳಿ ಇವತ್ತು ಹಾಜರಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವರಿಗೂ ಸಹ ನಾನು ಹೃತ್ಪೂರ್ವಕವಾಗಿ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ರಾಜ್ಯ ವಕೀಲರ ಪರಿಷತ್ತಿನ ವತಿಯಿಂದ ನಾನು ಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನ ಹೃದಯ ಪೂರ್ವಕವಾಗಿ ಕೋರ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೇನೆ ಅದ್ರ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಮಾಲಿಕೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಪ್ರಯೋಜನ ಪಡಿಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ನಮ್ಮೆಲ್ಲ ವಕೀಲ ಬಂಧುಗಳು ಆತ್ಮೀಯರು ಎಲ್ರೂ ಇದ್ದೀರಿ ನಿಮಗೂ ಸಹ ನಾನು ಹೃದಯ ಪೂರ್ವಕವಾದಂತ ಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನ ಕೋರ್ತೇನೆ ಎಲ್ರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಶುಭವಾಗಿ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಹರೀಶ್ ಸರ್ ನೈ ನೌ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಕಾಲ್ ಅಪಾನ್ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಬಸವರಾಜ್ ಎಸ್ ಸರ್ ಫಾರ್ಮರ್ ಪ್ರೆಸಿಡೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಬಾರ್ ಕೌನ್ಸಿಲ್ ಲಾ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ಟು ಡೆಲಿವರ್ ದ ಇನಿಷಿಯಲ್ ರಿಮಾರ್ಕ್ಸ್ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಕೆ ಎಸ್ ಬಿ ಸಿ ಲಾ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ಮತ್ತೆ ತನ್ನ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಗಳನ್ನ ಪುನರ್ ಆರಂಭಿಸಿದೆ ಇದಕ್ಕೆ ಕೆ ಎಸ್ ಬಿ ಸಿ ಲಾ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ಅಧ್ಯಕ್ಷರಾದ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೌತಮ್ ಚಂದರ್ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳನ್ನ ಅರ್ಪಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೇನೆ ದಿ ತ್ರೀ ಮೇಜರ್ ಅನಾಕ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಕ್ರಿಮಿನಲ್ ಸೆಗ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅಕಾರ್ಡಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಮೀ ಇಸ್ ಎ ಪ್ಯಾರಾಡೈಮ್ ಶಿಫ್ಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಕಲೋನಿಯಲ್ ಲೆಜಿಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಭಾರತೀಯ ನ್ಯಾಯ ಸಂಹಿತೆ ಭಾರತೀಯ ನಾಗರಿಕ ಸುರಕ್ಷಾ ಸಂಹಿತೆ ಭಾರತೀಯ ಸಾಕ್ಷ ಅಧಿನಿಯಮ್ ಅಧಿನಿಯಮ್ ನೌ ದಿ ವೆನ್ ಐ ಸೇ ಪ್ಯಾರಾಡೈಮ್ ಶಿಫ್ಟ್ ದೆರ್ ಇಸ್ ಎ ಕ್ರಿಟಿಕಲ್ ಅನಾಲಿಸಿಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ್ರೀ ತ್ರೀ ಅನಾಕ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮೇಜರ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಲೆಜಿಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಬೈ ದ ಪಾರ್ಲಿಮೆಂಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಕುಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಇನ್ ಅಮೆಂಡ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಟು ದಿ ಅನಾಕ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಬ್ರಿಂಗಿಂಗ್ ದ ಎಂಟೈರ್ಲಿ ನ್ಯೂ ಸೆಗ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೆಜಿಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಮೈ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಶ್ಯಾಮ್ ಸುಂದರ್ ವಿಲ್ ಆನ್ಸರ್ ದೋಸ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆನ್ಸರ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಐ ಹೋಪ್ ನೋ ಬಿ ಎನ್ ಎಸ್ ಎಸ್ ದಿ ಕ್ರಿಮಿನಲ್ ಪ್ರೊಸೀಜರ್ ಕೋಡ್ ಆಸ್ ಯು ಅವರ್ ವೇರ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಫೈವ್ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ತರ್ಟಿ ಒನ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಫೈವ್ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ತರ್ಟಿ ಒನ್ ರಿಪೀಲ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಅರ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಅನಾಕ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ನೋ ಆಸ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಅವೇರ್ ದಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ರಿಮಿನಲ್ ಪ್ರೊಸೀಜರ್ ಕೋಡ್ ವಾಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಇಯರ್ ಏಯ್ಟೀನ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಏಟ್ ದೆನ್ ಇಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ರಿಪೀಲ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ಕ್ರಿಮಿನಲ್ ಪ್ರೊಸೀಜರ್ ಕೋಡ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟಿ ತ್ರೀ ನಾವು ವಿತ್ ದಿಸ್ ಅನಾಕ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ದಿ ಅರ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಕ್ರಿಮಿನಲ್ ಪ್ರೊಸೀಜರ್ ಕೋಡ್ ಆಫ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟಿ ತ್ರೀ ಇಸ್ ಇಸ್ ರಿಪೀಲ್ಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಕಂಟೈನ್ಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಫೈವ್ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ತರ್ಟಿ ಒನ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ನೋ ಬಿ ಎನ್ ಎಸ್ ಭಾರತೀಯ ನ್ಯಾಯ ಸಂಹಿತೆ ಇಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ತ್ರೀ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಏಟ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಅಲ್ಲ ತ್ರೀ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಏಟ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ತ್ರೀ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಏಟ್ ರಿಪೀಲ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಪಿನಲ್ ಕೋಡ್ ನೋ ಭಾರತೀಯ ಸಾಕ್ಷ್ಯ ಅಧಿನಿಯಮ್ ಇಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಒನ್ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟಿ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ರಿಪೀಲ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಎವಿಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಕ್ಟ್ ಸೊ ದಿ ಆಲ್ ದ ತ್ರೀ ಅನಾಕ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಪಿನಲ್ ಕೋಡ್ ದಿ ಕ್ರಿಮಿನಲ್ ಪ್ರೊಸೀಜರ್ ಕೋಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದಿ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಎವಿಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಕ್ಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಕಮ್ ಟು ಎ ಗ್ಲೋರಿಯಸ್ ಎಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಸರ್ವಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಕ್ರಿಮಿನಲ್ ಜೂರಿಸ್ ಪ್ರುಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಓವರ್ ಎ ಪೀರಿಯಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೋರ್ ದೆನ್ ಎ ಸೆಂಚುರಿ ಆರ್ ಸೋ ನೌ ಸಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮೇಜರ್ ಆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಯು ವುಡ್ ಆ ಕಮ್ ಟು ನೋ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ದಿ ಮೀಡಿಯಾ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಎಲೆಕ್ಟ್ರಾನಿಕ್ ಮೀಡಿಯಾ ಈಸ್ ಅ ಸೆಡಿಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ರಿಮೂವ್ ದಿ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸ್ಡ್ ಕ್ರೈಮ್ ಈಸ್ ಮೇಡ್ ಪನಿಷಬಲ್ ಮಾಬ್ ಲಿಂಚಿಂಗ್ ಈಸ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ವೆರಿ ಹೈಲಿ ಕಾಂಟ್ರವರ್ಷಿಯಲ್ ಅ
Now, email complaints can be lodged. Summons can be sent electronically. Now, electronic evidence are now admissible. Now, the photocopies are also considered as secondary evidence. These are, I'm talking about all the three uh, enactments. To dissect these three enactments in a systematic manner, we have with us Mr. Shamsundar, my close friend and designated senior advocate from the Karnataka High Court. So without much ado, I request Mr. Shamsundar to take over and lead all of us and enlighten uh, the gathering, including the students of law like me. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank welcome, you. sir. You want to say something or should I start? Uh, so we have an introduction. This is a brief introduction of a uh, speaker. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead with Gautam Sen, sir, because that will be an uh, inappropriate beginning. <laughs> Thank you, Basvarad, sir. Now I would like to call upon Advocate Darsha Sethia to formally introduce our esteemed speaker for today. Good evening, all. It's my privilege to introduce to you today our distinguished speaker, uh, whose expertise and dedication in the field of law has made a significant impact. Please join me in welcoming Mr. M. S. Shan Sundar, a senior advocate in the High Court of Karnataka. Sir is a very well-known advocate in the state of Karnataka. However, uh, I would feel it appropriate to introduce him formally to this gathering. Sir has completed his master's in law from University Law College, Bangalore. With a career spanning over three decades, he has appeared in several law matters involving state and public interest and several important cases involving questions of law and has numerous reported cases to his credit. In 2022, he was designated as a senior advocate by the High Court of Karnataka, a testament to his expertise and contributions to the legal profession. Sir has also worked as a special public prosecutor and special government lawyer in several important matters and was also honored with the Buddha Prashasti Award and the State Award by Kshatriya Tigala Veera, to name a few, for his extraordinary work and to, the support, to support the scheduled caste and scheduled uh, tribe groups, the poor and the underprivileged people. He is also, well -known, uh, he's also a well-known author and has published several papers on legal and non-legal matters and has also written several articles on legal notions in leading newspapers. He has, he has been an integral part of several state, or state and national conferences, TV panel discussions, addressing critical issues in the legal field. He has not only fought for justice, but has also been a guiding light for many navigating the complex uh, cities of the legal system. We are truly privileged to have you, sir, this evening. We look forward to hearing your valuable insights. Thank you, Van and all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dasha. Kindly requesting all the audiences to send across all your questions and queries in the Q&A box. After the lecture is over for 15 minutes, our panelists will pose some of the selected questions to our esteemed speaker, requesting you all to utilize this opportunity to make most out of this academic initiative. Now, sir, the forum is open to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gautam Ji. Thank you, uh, Basurat sir. Thank you, Harish. And uh, uh, thank you, the host. Uh, uh, in the beginning, I would like to thank all the viewers who have joined us today. And uh, it's, in fact, a privilege for me to be addressing uh, whatever I know. In fact, uh, Basurat sir was telling that uh, I'll be enlightening. It may not be so. It may be it's like it's a joint learning process. Because every day is a learning process and uh, the process of learning never ends. <clears throat> Therefore, while I am in discussion with whatever I know, whatever I have been able to gather looking at this new law and uh, its uh, recent past, that is the Indian Evidence Act 1872, which we have been following for, uh, uh, for a long, long period. You know, in fact, the age of the law itself clearly says it's from 1872 Till July 1st of 2024, we have been following Indian Evidence Act, which was a code which was uh, made by the uh, British. And uh, we, in fact, carried it even after our, our independence as it is. Uh, so let us today try to <clears throat> uh, know a little about why is the new law that has come into force? What was the need? What was the underlying reason behind the new law? I said, if you ask me, is there a big change in the Indian Evidence Act? The answer is maybe no, because there is no 
great change in the Indian uh, Evidence Act. Of course, there are some significant changes in uh, the two other laws, the new law that occupies the place of criminal procedure code, the new law uh, that is the, that occupies the place of uh, Indian Penal Code. But when it comes to Indian Evidence Act, except dealing with some portions of electronic evidence, there is no much changes. Why is it that there is no much change in the Evidence Act is one principal question that crops up. Why is there no change means it's because the law of evidence itself is a principle based law. It's, it's, it's the entire law of evidence hinges upon certain settled principles, uh, which was uh, a, a development which developed over a period of time by the uh, common law of uh, 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 England. Uh, you all know what common law is. Common law is basically a law emanating from a set of judgments, what the previous courts said, what the previous judges said, and we accept the same, we go on uh, reforming it to the next level, and that's how the common law develops. Common law is not a sudden codified law, but however, though the Indian Evidence Act, the principles underlying the Indian Evidence Act were the uh, child of common law, the English felt, the, Brit the, 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 the Britishers felt, the uh, uh, Crown of England felt that uh, there was a need for codified evidence act uh, to be applied in India. Now, when we see the history as the Indian Evidence Act by its year of enactment suggested that it was 1872, uh, the law was brought into force and till July 1st, 2024, we followed the same law. Now, a great question uh, surfaces. Uh, did we not know the law of evidence before 1872? So that is something which has to be answered for us because I have another uh, five more days to go with you. I'm going to deal with uh, various parts of uh, Bharatiya Saksha in the uh, coming hours. But today, let's basically understand what is the importance of law of, uh, law of evidence. Uh, of course, I was requested also to talk in between, if possible, in Canada. But uh, uh, I wish to avoid because many of our uh, 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 participants today uh, may not pick up if I say something in between in Canada. But I would like to say one of such instances, uh, we have uh, a very uh, reputed senior advocate on the criminal side in Karnataka by name Mr. C.H. Anmantraya. One day when I was talking to him, he was saying he has to his credit uh, closely about 800 and odd trials, criminal trials that are in murder cases. I think he's shortly going to complete 1,000. We'll all celebrate. Uh, so one day he was telling, I was in conversation with him. Uh, he was telling the law of evidence, forget about the criminal procedure code, forget about the criminal uh, Indian penal code. Indian penal code comes into picture and there is a particular kind of offense. So... Procedure code, criminal procedure code tells us how to deal with a particular offense when it, it when it is when it is brought before the justice delivery system. So the law of evidence particularly had a particular uh, uh, you know comment that he says whoever made the Indian Evidence Act or whoever made the law of evidence, they are not just ordinary men. They are uh, people with great brains and they are tapasvis. Tapasvis means you can understand what is the uh, the density of the expression. Not any ordinary person could have conceived what all is written in the Evidence Act because it takes care of you. Just imagine a situation from 90, 1872 till 2024, we followed the law because, and all our courts all across the country, they applied Indian Evidence Act and uh, the fertility of the Indian Evidence Act was so much that we hardly had any situation which was beyond the Evidence Act which the law could not deal. So, under Saksha, Bharatiya Saksha, now what exactly has happened is, there is a lot of uh, import, of course, without any derogation. Uh, most of the Indian Evidence Act that existed hitherto has been imported. And of course, we have uh, named it, christened it newly um, as Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam 2023. Now, I was... I was, I, was, I was saying that before 1872, the law of evidence was codified and applied to India, Indian territories. What did happen before? Before did we, did we not have a situation of dealing with evidence? We had. Of course, if I may uh, quote a small incident that uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata, the great epics of India, are, uh, uh, are, 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 are too ancient 
Even in those days, we have cases where the evidence was applied. So the smallest example is I can give when um, uh, Sita Ma was abducted by Ravanasura uh, when she was being carried. He flew her. Uh, in fact, Ravanasura knew the art of flying in the air. Uh, so he carries her and uh, he uh, flew over to Lanka. At that time, to leave the traces, what Sitama did was Sitama went on dropping her jewels so that uh, there will be some traces of evidence where she is being taken to. Just see the concept of evidence then. Then what happens when uh, Ram, when Ramji comes looking for Sitama, uh, he would find all these jewels scattered uh, at many places in the forest. He would show the jewels to Lakshman and say, Lakshman, see, these are all the jewels of your uh, 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 Babi, that is uh, your sister-in-law. Uh, can you identify this? He'll go on showing the jewels one by one. He will show the jewels that are worn on the head. He will show the jewels that are worn in the neck. He will show the jewels that are worn in the upper part of the body. He will show the rings and Lakshman will go on saying, no, I don't identify this. I don't identify this. Then finally, he will show the pile that is the anklet worn by Sitama. Then he will say, yes, I now identify. So the evidence, what Lakshman knew, only that he identified. Why Lakshman only identify anklet means in those days, the uh, Lakshman was so disciplined. He was uh, an embodiment of highest disciplines in life. He said, brother, I have not seen uh, Mother Sita by her face till today. What I have seen is only her feet. Therefore, I identify only the anklet, nothing else. And finally, the third level of evidence in the same Ramayana story. When uh, Hanuman was asked to go to Lanka and find Sitama, and obviously they had a question because uh, Hanuman uh, was not known to uh, the Ramayan family before uh, the story of the part of uh, Sitama abduction. Hanuman joins in between. So uh, Sitama should not get startled that, you know, the strange looking man uh, is coming and uh, trying to do something because in Lanka it was all strange characters. So she should not find to her surprise once again and to get startled that who is this strange looking man? Is he once again trying to fool me saying that he is the emissary of Rama? Then what Ram Ramji did, he had given uh, one of the jewels which he found, that is that ring. And uh, he would ask Hanumanji to show it to Sita so that Sitama will come to know that you are my emissary. This is the proof. See how beautiful we had law and instances of using evidence. I would also tell you one more small story of Raja Vikramaditya. I think this preface is very much necessary because the catapult, the total shift into Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam is also for one reason that as Basavaraj sir rightly put it that we were trying to undress from that colonial fabric which we carried even after more than seven decades of independence. So I'll have to tell you some more instances in the history we did have all these principles because law of evidence is completely the law of principles. Certain thing, a certain thing, a certain, it has to be done in a certain principled way. That is how we have subsequently codified it and kept it under a particular section. So one more instance which I would like to share that we all know the Raja of uh, Ujjain, Raja Vikramaditya was very famous for his greatest judgment and analysis of evidence. And he was so famous that one day, in the heaven, when uh, two uh, dancers of uh, uh, Mahendra, Indra's court, uh, fell into a competition, Ramba and Urvashi, they said they started climbing, I am the greatest dancer, I am the greatest dancer. So the um, Indra of uh, heaven, the king of heaven, he really fell into a, a, a big time puzzle and how to sort it out. Both of them, they were extremely good. Both of them, they were extremely equal. That it's very difficult to pass a judgment who is good or who is inferior. So uh, they couldn't make, but both cannot be equal because both are fighting. So the Indra had to address this. So they found one greatest judge. You, the Indra said, you call that Raja Vikramaditya from Ujjain. He is the one who is known for troubleshooting all these kind of uh, trickiest issues. So uh, Vikramaditya was called. Vikramaditya was called and Vikramaditya was very happy to go and because he was uh, uh, called to be a judge. 
uh, to watch the dance of uh, Ramba and Urvashi and uh, pass a judgment that who is the best. So the moment Vikramaditya goes to the court and before the competition began, he would summon for two freshly made uh, jasmine garlands. Kindly, you know, just listen to this, how interesting this story is. So two freshly made garlands made out of jasmine flower because jasmine flower is very, very sensitive flower. That's the reason he summoned. And before the dance competition began, Vikramaditya would simply say, make each of them wear one of these garlands and then start. Okay, both of them were made, Ramba and Urvashi were made to wear these garlands. And uh, they started dance and both of them were absolutely incredible, absolutely equal and nobody else in the courtroom could make a decision of placing somebody high or somebody low. And after the entire dance was over, Indra once again looked at Vikramaditya and all the courter, courtiers and asked, could any one of you find any difference? Everyone said, no, absolutely there was no difference. Both of them were equal. Then Vikrama stood and Vikrama was asked, now Vikramaditya, you are a judge here. Now, how would you resolve this problem? And simply Vikramaditya would say, Ramba is the best, Urvashi is a bit inferior. Then Indra asked, how did you make that? Then he said, that is the reason I summoned those two garlands, which is the proof. What is that? Look at both the garlands. Not both the garlands are looking same fresh as they were. The garland that was worn around the neck of Ramba is still fresh. The garland that was worn by Urvashi has already withered. Because as I said, the jasmine flower is very, very uh, sensitive to temperatures. And a little temperature, body temperature, little temperature goes up, it withers. So he showed it to Indra, look at the body temperature of Urvashi was more because she was tense. That's the reason the flowers have withered. And Ramba has danced without any fear, without any tension. Therefore, she has been, uh, she, she can be held um, uh, for better deliveries and fearless deliveries. See, look at the history of evidence with what we have used in the history. So, we cannot say that before the British made the Indian Evidence Act 1872 and gave us that we had dearth of uh, evidence, dearth of principles governing the evidence. In fact, there are a lot of Dharma Sutra, Dharma Shastras, Puranas in which we see a lot of instances where evidence was applied, fundamental rules of evidence were applied, who has to give evidence against whom. Of course, we always come across something called as partisan evidence. That means Evidence given by somebody who is closely, closely related is not generally accepted because they'll have their own partialities, they'll have their own preferences in giving evidence in favor or against somebody. Therefore, we did have all these kind of law of evidence even before the British gave us. But what Bishop British gave us by way of Indian Evidence Act was something really incredible. It was a classic piece of law because all those instances how, where, why the evidence has to be given, to what evidence has to be given, what should not be, what to what should not, evidence, evidence need not be given, what does not require evidence, what requires evidence, what require, what degree of evidence, all these things were codified by the British and it was given to us in 1872. And as we all know, the year suggests in 1872, we were not independent, we became independent only in 1947. So, 1872 is clearly a colonial era. More particularly, it was called as British Raj because we see some uh, difference between the company's rule and British rule. Till uh, 19, 1857, till the Sipai mutiny started uh, upon the, on which instance the crown, British crown, that is Queen Victoria felt that from now onwards, the entire administration of India shall be shifted from directly company rule to the rule of the crown directly. Till then, the company rule was there for a long period from uh, 1600 six till uh, almost uh, 1858. Till 1858, we were under the company's rule. And after that, the crown took over and the legislation that is 1872 Indian Evidence Act it was, of course, after we came under the British Raj. So we have, uh, prior to British Raj, we were, we were into princely governance. After the uh, colonial administration, the East India Company came 
East India Company came in as a trading uh, entity. Thereafter, they went on. Uh, they, 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 it became a political entity. Uh, two errors done by, of course, we as Indians, we have to, of course, we'll have to say some errors done by our ancestors proved as very, very, uh, 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 very disastrous. Uh, one in north and one in south. In north, uh, King Jahangir, in south, the Raja of Chandragiri gave the East India Company to license, uh, the license to have uh, their own colonies and uh, their own laws to be used in those colonies, which over a period of time engulfed into it all the Indian subjects and the princely states could be easily won over and one by one, one by one, one by one, the colonial administration, that is the company's administration, won over all our princely kings, they all came under the heavy duty of the British administrators and one by one we got into all this uh, new era of using new laws. So as we see once again 1872 was uh, we were not independent uh, we were under the British rule till uh, 1947 and after 1947 in fact as rightly said by many after 1947, 1950, we got our own constitution. We did not uh, continue to follow anybody else's constitution. We got our own constitution, but we continued to follow the laws that were given by the British as it is. So what was needed, what was felt by the present government was that uh, we, we no more live under the British rule. We no more live under the British governance, then why are we following the same laws? Of course, the principles in those laws we shall follow, but why are we following the same laws with the same nomenclature without any discontinuity? So the discontinuity should have happened and it should have been subsequently called as uh, some law which was recognized by the Indian parliament after we got our own parliament, but we did not do that. We continued to follow in spite of our uh, parliament, our governance came into existence. Therefore, the highest step that was taken by the uh, previous government, the present government, the previous government, of course, present government is a continuation of the previous government. The previous government took a great step by saying that now let us just uh, remove this colonial fabric and we will have, though we import the same, though we have the same sections, you know, they have almost same principles, same uh, verbatim, uh, maybe same nomenclature, the same headings, same titles, everything same, but we will call it uh, with our own name, uh, indigenous name, that we'll call it as Bharatiya Saksha Adiniyam, so that we feel that we did something. It, it belongs to us that we are not following something else which was done uh, uh, sometime uh, long ago will have something of our own. Of course, that was a good step. But of course, it's all there in the public domain. This was the reason. But the objects, the statement of objects and reasons does not say this. The statement of objects and reasons, of course, as the Basavaraj sir rightly said, that there are a lot of arguments that we could have instead had an uh, amendment, uh, just an amendment. Uh, why why did we why did we change the entire entire nomenclature why did we call it new of course in the debates in the underlying papers we have all these things said there of course we wanted to get rid of that colonial shadow which was still following us which was in fact overshadowing us but in the statements of um, objects and reasons what is told is the important change that is introduced under the bharatiya saksha is with respect to bringing in the uh, additional, uh, uh, the developed version of uh, uh, law of evidence, which extends to electronic evidence, because we are in an electronic era. Uh, so many things, in fact, we have uh, all of us uh, almost, uh, uh, if I may say nearly about closely about more than uh, uh, 250 of us, we are all here because of the electronic uh, facilities. So. Why not we have something more in this electronic era, something added significantly to the law of evidence. Therefore, the Evidence Act of 19, 1872, which did not deal with uh, particularly 
uh, the law of evidence pertaining to electronic evidence, of course, we did have, we have uh, Information Technology Act that came in in 2000. Uh, we had to read Information Technology Act along with law of evidence together to deal with a lot of electronic evidence and the matters pertaining concerning electronic evidence. But um, the Evidence Act, which, which is in the present avatar, that is Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam, in itself, it incorporates all the uh, aspects pertaining to electronic evidence. So this uh, is basically the reason that uh, we are into a new era of uh, law of evidence, I can say. But do we have to be confused or do we have to be uh, scared that uh, uh, we have been all along following the Indian Evidence Act and we have read the Indian Evidence Act thoroughly, we have understood the Indian Evidence Act thoroughly and there have been thousands and lakhs of judgments by the Honorable High Court and by the Honorable Supreme Court touching, of course, every, every part of every facet of law of evidence. Should we have to forego all those things and start following or start reading something new which we have not yet uh, acclimatized to? The answer is not at all because there is nothing new in Bharatiya Saksha Adhinim except that it is an improvised version a little more sophisticated and improvised version of the Indian Evidence Act. So none of us need to be uh, uh, worrisome about the new law. Of course, even with respect to Nagrik Suraksha Samhita and even with respect to Nyay Samhita also, there is nothing, uh, in fact, there is nothing, uh, the old is not taken away as such. Of course, it is a reformed version. All these three uh, new laws, are the reformed version of uh, old laws without uh, uh, without uh, making us forget anything of the old law. The old law, in fact, of course, the old law, which we may have to shed the old law only after another 10, 20 years, because all the three laws have savings in it. What is going to be applied? These three new laws are going to be applied only in respect of the matters, the cases that would get registered entirely after 1st July, or whatever, even if the incident has happened prior to 1st July, the old laws and old legislations will be applied. That's what is the saving under, I think, all the new law. Therefore, uh, 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 therefore, so there is nothing worrisome and we need not to have any kind of worries that uh, we have to follow something new which we have to once again sit and read and uh, uh, I was not in fact it's uh, since I am uh, here addressing the uh, lecture series I'm interacting on the lecture series with series which is now hosted by the Karnataka State Bar Council I'm afraid if even the curriculum uh, in the all the colleges also uh, is going to be replaced with Bharti Nyaya Samhita Bharti Nagrik Suraksha Samhita and Bharti Saksha Adhiniyam I think uh, uh, Mr. Gautam Chand and uh, Mr. Basaraj will answer that issue later because unless and until from now onwards, even in the curriculum our students study these things in its new uh, version, it may be very difficult for them in the coming days because they can't study something old and try to come into the court and practice something new. Therefore, it is necessary that all the colleges, all the educational institutions should also start um, implementing these three new laws. I think there should be already circulars. I don't know about whether the curriculum has changed or not. Of course, if the curriculum has not changed, I think it should change. Now, as I told, uh, it is an improvised version. It is a more sophisticated version of the old laws. Therefore, no need to worry about the judgments, score of judgments, which are Honorable High Courts and Supreme Courts have delivered. And on these legal principles of law of evidence, on the legal principles of either two of uh, two other courts also because all remain the same everything will continue to apply to us because all these all these three laws are principle based laws there is uh, nothing new can be invented nothing novel can be invented here now coming to the statement of objects and reasons as i said uh, it only deals with uh, because of the uh, introduction of uh, new phase of electronic evidence and uh, a great, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, uh, the electronic interface is going to matter uh, into the justice delivery to a very, very great extent. So we'll have to have these things. And I would say with a lot of proud that our state was the first state to form rules in respect of electronic evidence. 
And uh, if you ask me, our high court was the first high court perhaps to form the uh, norms regarding uh, conferencing, video conferencing, etc. And uh, we have been in fact a step ahead, if I may say it, with a lot of proud as compared to others that uh, in following electronic evidence, we have taken, I think we are, we are a step ahead than compared to others, um, which I say it with proud, as I said. Now, coming to the outlines of the Indian Evidence Act, which was then now Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam, of course, there are some changes uh, uh, which we see uh, basically uh, as I told you, the basic norms, basic laws have not been subjected to any change. Even the verbatim phraseology, everything remains same as it is. Only thing is it has been rearranged, codified in a different uh, arrangement of sections. So all that we'll have to now get used to is instead of quoting earlier sections, we may have to quote the new sections by its number. Otherwise, the principles, the core of the uh, law which existed earlier uh, remains vastly uh, the same. Therefore, uh, we may have to now first memorize uh, the section, the, the arrangement of sections uh, under the new laws, particularly the Bharatiya Saksha. I recall one of the judgments of our Honorable High Court, His Lordship Justice Krishna Dikshit, while elaborating on the on section 154 and 155 of Law of Evidence, that uh, uh, His Lordship Justice Krishna Dikshit dealt with what is hostile evidence and to what extent our own witness can be examined, cross-examined by us. There's a beautiful judgment of His Lordship Justice Krishna Dikshit. I would request all of you to read it. Why I am saying this particular, why I am citing this particular judgment for today's session that his lordship was delivering the judgment on the civil side. Now, but generally we have a perception that law of evidence means only criminal law practitioners uh, should have, more, should lay more emphasis in knowing the law of evidence. Uh, the civil law practitioners uh, need not read it with greater depth. This is what is something which always bothers us because the nomenclature of uh, the bundle of laws which we have always had is you always found the major major criminal laws, law of evidence as a part of major criminal laws, not law of evidence as a part of major civil laws. Of course, I'm afraid if we have something called as major civil laws, we don't have something called as major civil laws, but Major criminal act means it will have law of evidence in it. So this did uh, put a lot of our young lawyers and the young learners into some kind of a confused situation whether law of evidence concerns only criminal law or does it uh, uh, matter with, uh, in fact, in, 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 in all the other areas of law, may it be civil litigation, may it be other areas of litigation. The answer is there is no separate evidence act for civil law. There is no separate act for some other areas of law. The law of evidence is one single, which is equally applicable to the criminal uh, justice uh, uh, side and always and also and as well as the civil justice and other areas of law uh, as well. So only for the purpose of convenience and only for the as a, as a folk way we have uh, classified a law of evidence as. Uh, uh, one of the major legislations on the criminal side. There is a reason for this. What is the reason? Uh, the fundamental principles of criminal jurisprudence is that the degree of evidence which is required in the criminal prosecution, in the criminal justice system is proof beyond reasonable doubt. But when it comes to other areas of law, that proof beyond reasonable doubt is not it is not a strictly adhered principle. For example, under Bharatiya Saksha, there is one very uh, 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 thrilling provision which all of us will have to read. That is uh, section 1. I think we all should read section 1 of Bharatiya Saksha, which is, of course, this was there in the Indian Evidence Act also earlier. Um, Bharatiya Saksha, chapter 1, chapter 1 has uh, a very limited sections under it. 
So, Bharatiya Saksha Chapter 1 defines a short title application and commencement. This act may be called as Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam. The name of the act is strictly kept as Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam and we are not going to uh, call it in English with our own translated version. We are not going to call it with any other languages with our own translated version. It shall be always called and referred to as Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam. We have already started uh, uh, abbreviating it. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, we have already started using the short uh, form of uh, Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam. Uh, BSA, BSA, uh, BNS, BNS, BNSS. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really afraid if we are allowed to do that and we should not be. In fact, uh, 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 many times the judges, uh, uh, I have seen many judges do reprimanding our young lawyers uh, saying that WSC is not filed. What is WS means? You know, this is our own uh, accriminated, abbreviated version of a written statement. The WS can, can also uh, stand for something else. So therefore, as lawyers, as law students, as law learners, we should avoid this abbreviating. We should, we should, we should in fact use whenever it is possible, as much as possible, Unless and until we get some judgments where the Honorable Supreme Court or the Honorable High Courts themselves, they start abbreviating it. Till then, let us not have the liberty of abbreviating it our own selves at our own levels because it will be too convenient space because law is not the business of convenience. Law is the business of strict adherence and it is not the business of convenience. Therefore, let us not abbreviate it as of now unless and until we have some judgments of the Honorable Supreme Court or the Honorable High Courts where we are permitted to abbreviate, to put it in a short form. Till then, let us call it as Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam. That's the reason. Section 1, short title, application and commencement. Uh, section 1, subsection 1 says, this act may be called the Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam 2023. And what is very, very important is, this is what I was trying to tell you. Section 1, subsection 2. Please listen to this carefully. This is very interesting. It applies to all judicial proceedings in or before any court, including courts martial, but not to affidavits presented to any court or officer, nor to proceeding before an arbitrator. So it applies to every court. May it be a civil court, may it even be a court martial proceedings. Uh, many of uh, you may be having a question, what exactly is court martial proceedings? Many of us know and many of our young friends may not be knowing what is court martial proceedings. Court martial proceedings is something to do with the armed forces when they want to adjudicate some uh, member of the armed forces. They can't be adjudicated in a regular court. They have something of, they have their own courts. Uh, the proceedings before those army courts are called as court martial proceedings. If you have some more doubts on that, you please keep it in your mind and post it to me when I complete the session of the day because we have 15 minutes of question and answers there. I try to answer as much as possible. Then it applies to even court martial proceedings. It applies to all proceedings before every court. May it be a civil court, may it be a tribunal, may it be any court, may it be a criminal court, any court. But it does not apply to two things. Number one, affidavits presented before any courts or any officer. Number two, very importantly, the proceedings before an arbitrator. Now, uh, just imagine, have we come across, many of us must have dealt with a lot of arbitration cases. And uh, in the arbitration cases, I have hardly seen any case that's going without evidence. Of course, we do have certain uh, arbitration proceedings where it goes on admissions and denials, where it goes on purely uh, uh, agreed and disagreed documents. Uh, uh, in fact, actual taking of evidence on oath, examination in chief, cross-examination, re-examination, all these things, what we see under the Indian Evidence Act, uh, they do happen in arbitration, but why the Indian Evidence Act, in fact, Indian Evidence Act uh, 1872 also excluded the applicability of a law of evidence to arbitrations and even Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam also excludes the application of Indian uh, 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 application of the act, application of the Adhiniyam to arbitration proceedings. 
so in this session i think we need to understand with it uh, understand this particular uh, part with a greater depth why is the arbitration proceedings uh, are kept out of the applicability of evidence act now what happens in the uh, under the evidence act now tomorrow onwards when we go on dealing with uh, a lot of other areas of uh, saksha adhiniyam we see the fundamentals of evidence law is that a uh, fact fact relevant and to prove what evidence has to be to have, evidence has to be given what kind of evidence has to be given how the evidence has to be given where we need not to give evidence what has to be presumed as uh, existing evidence these are the intricacies of the law of evidence now by applying the law of evidence why we say especially in the uh uh indian conditions indian environment of uh, uh, justice delivery why the case the closure the beginning and the closure of the case takes a long way is because the lot of time that gets consumed in the trial what is the trial trial is where the evidence is tested finally when the honorable judge accepts the evidence it becomes a proof that is totally proved so the entire endeavor of the parties as we as lawmen we as lawyers is that we have to reach the court to finally accept the evidence and to make the court make the honorable judge reach a stage that he has to finally accept this part of the evidence as final there is a lot of synthesis that happens in between so you have to sift you have to go through you have to deny you have to rebut you have to demolish so many things comes in between the 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 uh, the uh, the process of uh, evidence the entire process of evidence itself is multi layered it's cumbersome it's multi dimensional so what would happen if we apply the same kind of complicated challenging procedure to the law of arbitration every other arbitration itself is a shorter way to put an end to the litigation in fact arbitration uh, of, you know as mode of uh, settlement of disputes uh, was agreed upon after a lot of dialogue at an international level at uh, various levels and finally the arbitration was an alternative room to decide the dispute disputes differences on a faster mode on a rapid mode than falling behind following the same old twisty and turny road where you have your chance i have my chance i'll deny this you will not admit this etc etc what we do by applying the law of evidence so the makers thought it kindly see even in 1872 this was the position they all felt that applying the strictness of law of evidence to arbitrations will take away the very purpose of an alternative mechanism to put an end to a dispute on a faster mode therefore this exclusion was uh, in fact well thought over and this exclusion was then called out and kept under the law and bharatiya saksha adhiniyam also incorporates the same therefore of course uh, having said this if the bharatiya saksha adhiniyam or the indian evidence act did not apply to arbitration the, how the arbitrator will decide if something requires evidence so what has been decided by way of various judgments various analysis of law is that do not strictly the evidence act by its strict sense in stricto sensu is not applicable the principles of law of evidence can always be applied to arbitration proceedings also and the arbitral tribunals will have their own jurisdiction to deal with the uh, 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 the the uh, matters where the evidence has to be taken where the evidence has to be led at their at their discretion without going by the strict path of the law of evidence or saksha adhiniyam they can have little more uh, you know convenientized Uh, to to suit something to the convenience of the 
the fast track justice what we see under the arbitration law. Therefore, there is a departure of the applicability of uh, Saksha Adhiniyam to the arbitration proceedings and to the affidavits. And why, having said uh, arbitrations, why am I not saying anything about the affidavits? The answer is very simple. An affidavit is somebody's own statement on oath. What is an affidavit? I am swearing to an affidavit. I am saying that I am swearing to this on oath, to my consciousness. Then if you apply law of evidence once again, I am not doing it at my conscious, I am doing it by a procedure governed under law. Then the affidavit itself will lose its fundamental concept of it being an affidavit, that is statement on oath. Therefore, there is a departure of the applicability in so far as the affidavits concerned and in so far as the arbitral proceedings are concerned. So, this was there earlier, exactly that has been brought over and kept as it is uh, under the new law also. There is not much change in uh, the applicability, but there is something very uh, important. Earlier, uh, Section 1, uh, 1972 Act read, it started, uh, it, it began with the reading in a fashion it extends to the whole of India and applies to all judicial proceedings in or before any court, including courts, martial, etc., etc. So the beginning was it extends to whole, extends to the whole of India. Kindly see, this is what is missing under the uh, Saksha Adhiniyam. That is, it does not say that it extends to whole of India, but it only says that as this act may be called, as Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam. So why is not we why why we are not saying here under the Bharatiya Saksha that it extends and it applies to all of India? Uh, of course, I would want you to give some reasons because the law does not say by itself why this is not kept under the new act. So it is for us to apply thought process and know why there has been the departure from saying that it applies to the whole of India, which we don't say it now. Is it for the reason that uh, 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 should we should we limit the bounds of India by saying that it applies to all of India? So India can become anything in future. India can, 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 can get into it a larger India in future. Therefore, are we now, are we, are we, are we, are we saying that uh, we, 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 the lawmakers felt that why should we uh, say it uh, overtly or why should we say it expressly that it extends to the entire India we will simply say this act is going to be called as Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam 2023 no need of saying that it extends to all of India because it is understood tomorrow India uh, uh, can be uh, can even be uh, a bigger picture of uh, what we have uh, had in the past what we have have what we have been having now and what we may have in future. So a thought process, why the legislators have uh, willfully and consciously have left out this beginning portion which had earlier, which we don't have now, is uh, a matter that, uh, uh, that prompts and triggers a lot of thought and reasoning. So we'll have more of that when we start using the law, when the court starts interpreting. So as regards to the preliminary under chapter one, there is nothing much, but chapter 2 onwards, of course, it is a rearranged version. Uh, chapter 2 deals with relevancy of facts, which will go into all those things. Um, uh, of course, not chapter 2, I'm sorry. Part 2 deals with relevancy act, under which there is one chapter, that is chapter 2. Part 3 of the Saksha Adhiniyam deals with on proof, uh, of course, uh, which has uh, different chapters on that. Uh, of course, we'll have to uh, go a little more uh, in detail on that. Uh, then we have uh, other parts. Uh, uh, the third part, which deals with uh, part three, deals with on proof. Uh, then part four deals with production and effect of evidence. Uh, of course, with that part four, which has, of course, we can safely say that it has four parts with deals with a lot of different things tired under each part of it. Uh, now we will go from next session onwards, part by part. 
uh, we'll deal with all these things, uh, which which has, uh, of course, clearly demarcated areas of law of uh, evidence uh, under Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam. Of course, we can safely call it as Law of Evidence Act instead of uh, uh, Indian Evidence Act, which we used to call it, uh, call it earlier. So, what is Law of Evidence now in India is the Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam. So, if we are following anything in India as Law of Evidence, it's going to be Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyam. Now, uh, of course, uh, um, let me make my closing statement for the day that... Uh, the Evidence Act itself was, uh, 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 in fact, it was uh, a progressed version of common law. Of course, the Indian courts, Indian judiciary has contributed to law of evidence uh, 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 enormously. Uh, so many of our judgments, uh, uh, our Supreme Court judgments, our Honorable High Court's judgments, so many of our judgments have given a lot of different dimensions has expanded the scope of strict words of law of evidence which we had all those judgments all those expansions all those interpretations which have been offered by the high courts and the honorable supreme court will continue to apply because the principles remain the same in our next sessions we'll deal with various factors of course uh, given the limitation of time one hour every day we will try to cover as much as possible principally let's not get into section 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 wise and We'll go broadly what exactly are four different chapters of law of evidence, proof, relevancy, etc., etc. And uh, I'll be happy to be with you tomorrow once again. And uh, of course, in this session, we did not have a complete hour because the introduction, everything has to happen. I don't think you may have uh, much uh, questions today. From tomorrow onwards, of course, uh, uh, please have your questions. Uh, let me make a prompt attempt to answer that. Uh, so, uh, see you. Uh, I'm, I'm winding off, uh, uh, winding off for today's session. Thank you all for being with us. I think how many of them are uh, there? I think oh, a whopping of uh, more than 250. That's very great. It's a great audience. I think this is also going to be available on the Facebook and YouTube also in a recorded version. So uh, we can watch it again. We can see it again whenever we want. Uh, thank you so much for today's session. Thank you so much, Shyam Sindha, sir, for introducing the nuances of the newly implemented Bharatiya Sakshya Adhigan. Now, the